started. Good afternoon. This is um, the Discovery Lecture Series, as you know, was um, really created to bring the world's most influential researchers um, to our campus to share vision, creativity, um, the hard work uh, that's gone into their scientific achievements to give them exposure to us and um, to really give you an opportunity to learn about um, their lives in science and medicine. Um, this year, um, we uh, decided to also ask uh, newly elected members to the National Academies at Vanderbilt to present a discovery lecture because we think it's very important that you know their stories as well. And so I'm honored today that um, the speaker is from our own medical center faculty. Um, Kevin Johnson was elected to the IOM last fall and has participated in numerous Institute of Medicine committees related to child and adolescent health and medication errors over the years. He's an internationally renowned, renowned scholar. Um, I think the best way for me to characterize his work is really using creativity and innovation um, in the management of information to improve patient safety. Um, it's basic science, it's translational science, and it's clinical outcomes research. It's T1, T2, 3T, T5, it's everything. And um, he's also associate edit for, editor for the leading journal in biomedical informatics, Jamia. Kevin's been here since 2002. He came from that place in Baltimore, uh, Johns Hopkins, and um, where he attended medical school, did postgraduate training, served on the faculty for 10 years. Sounds familiar. Um, here along the way, he got a master's degree on the other coast in biomedical informatics at Stanford. Today, Kevin's professor and vice chair of DBMI, and he's also a professor of pediatrics. He is a pediatrician. He's really been a driving force for positioning Vanderbilt as the preeminent institution in this discipline um, and really leads us into the future as technology becomes ever more prevalent in how we think about healthcare and how to administer healthcare in all settings. Um, he's really showing us how to use technology not just to record information but to leverage it to truly change how we take care of patients. Kevin, it's an honor to have you give this lecture. Well, good early evening, everyone. I want to thank you for coming out this close to Christmas and to all of your, whatever winter holiday you happen to celebrate. I did wear my Christmas tie because I'm shamelessly that way. And it's also a pediatric tie because that's a part of who I am. I wanted to, to thank you guys, and I also want to thank you, Dr. Balzer, for that uh, very nice introduction. I was um, hoping to ask Dr. Balzer if he would give each of us an Oprah Winfrey-like set of my favorite things to include an iPad 2 and some other toys for your generosity and spending your time here, but I'm thinking he's not going to do that, so um, I'll just move on. If I could have the first slide and the lights down. So if you'll indulge me, I re I'm, rem I'm reminded that we're on camera, so I have to stay here. If you'll indulge me, I'm going to start with a very short video segment today. Um, I think it's fair to say that every one of us who is in any way involved with health care is motivated to do that in part by experiences we've had either as a patient or with patients. Um, if you happen to have been in that category, I think you'll really, this will resonate well with you. If you've been a patient or if you've had to know a patient, I kind of hope this doesn't resonate very well with you, but it is a reality of medicine. And I'm going to start here. You hear a word coming out of the physician's mouth and suddenly time stops because your head is wrapping around that single word. And when I stopped him and I said, are you telling me that he has cancer? So my husband had surgery, had the tumor removed, everything came back negative. And um, 22 months went by. And my husband came home one day, and it was just interesting that that particular day when he had gone to get his blood work results, he happened to bring home a copy of the lab report. I said, well, I'm flipping the page over, and I said, 
where is your CEA marker? I said, I, I want to know what your CEA is looking like right now. This is, this is the cancer marker for colon cancer. So I picked up the phone and he called his primary care physician's office, um, was speaking with a physician's assistant, and he said, can you tell me what my CEA is? And her response was, we thought that the surgical oncology group was monitoring that. And sure enough, his liver was fully engaged with cancer lesions in all parts of the liver and his lower left lung. We took the scans back to the surgical oncologist to show him. He looked and he looked very startled and he said, she was doing all the blood work. And I said, yes, I understand that now. But again, she thought you were doing it. He shook his head and he said, we should have caught this. I don't know if the outcome would have changed, but it's really hard to look back at the situation and not ask yourself whether or not things could have changed if they knew. So that sends a chill through my spine every time I watch it. Um, there's a lot that's really amazing about our healthcare system, but to see a patient have to have feet of charts in the kitchen and to have to think through how to manage information so that all of the parts of the, of the care system know everything that the other part knows um, is, is obviously a real stimulant for the kind of work that many of us in this room do. Today's healthcare system is in general amazing. We're able to do things today that were really not even the pipe dreams of healthcare providers 20 years ago. But we still suffer from some challenges. The healthcare system is fragmented. If you, talk to, um, if you look at some of the studies, patients with chronic disease have an average of seven providers who follow them, and that number goes up as the disease becomes a more multi-system organ failure type disease. And because of the handoffs and because of that fragmentation, we put patients in a really unrealistic role of having to both cope with an illness, cope with family, and be the glue that connects all of those healthcare systems. Furthermore, there are studies that talk about the world of the provider and the fact that we as providers, although we have an insurmountable amount of information, tons and tons of information, still leave somewhere around five questions on the table every half day we see patients. Furthermore, and then the final thing is redundant testing. Because we have such a hard time getting the information that we need, it's the case that about 9% in the best studies, 9% of the tests that are done are redundant tests. And what's especially sobering is that that number is agnostic to cost. So there are, high, there are very expensive tests that we do twice or three times, and there are very inexpensive tests that we do. So there's a lot that we can work on. And as an informatician and as a pediatrician, I see all of this and think we should be able to fix it. So the definition of biomedical informatics is a scientific field that deals with biomedical information, data, and knowledge, the storage, retrieval, and optimal use of that information for problem solving and decision making. It covers an incredibly large spectrum, and so I will forgive all of you for getting confused about all the different names, all of you who've ever said I do bioinformatics, for example. Um, but in fact, bioinformatics really refers to that part of biomedical informatics that is sort of subcellular. There are other names that we use for different types of informatics, including clinical informatics, which begins thinking about the diseases that patients have and how we can bring information to the point of care to improve decision making. Further out, we have public health informatics that's not shown on this slide that thinks about community or national areas of interest. Informatics also includes the development of research tools, educational tools, and clinical tools, and very recently, tools that help us with things like secondary data analysis or secondary data use for things like the e-learning or the learning e-health system or other initiatives that are underway. All of this has really transformed medicine. And uh, just some examples of things that I think all of us here, or many of us in medicine, know about. Evidence-based medicine at the point of care is now transforming um, medicine by providing information to clinicians when they need it. Systems biology and wellness is helping us to connect the mechanisms of disease across a, a bunch of otherwise disparate phenotypes and illness. Gene chip, gene chip technology for risk assessment is something that we've known about for some time, and we've really recently began to use it in in, real, in the real world, Vanderbilt being one of the first places to do some of that. Genome-wide associations and phenome-wide associations essentially help us to take some of our discoveries 
and understand their implications on a far wider scale. And one of the most exciting things is the idea that there are designer drugs that can truly personalize the way a particular patient's disease may be treated. So why is informatics so important and I would say so fun? And that's because it touches really every part of what we think about in medicine, from physician practice, clinical research, clinical teaching, medical administration, patient self-care, and public health. One of the most exciting things that's happened, and I think all of us will appreciate this, is something that Mark Weiser at Xerox Park many years ago started to predict. And that was the issue of what's called ubiquitous computing. The idea that we would go from a society where many people had access to one computer to the society that we're in now, where probably everyone in this room has at least three or four computers that they're going to touch between now and the time they get home. The iPad just represents a part of that phenomenon. We can't even begin to predict what's going to happen in the next 10 years. But what's clear is all of these technologies, especially what's happening now with mobile health, are things that are going to transform the way we, we think about health care and wellness. This is a picture of me from third grade. Uh, uh, Mark Frizzy and I were talking a little bit about sort of where, where this all started with me. And I'm pretty sure it didn't start there. Um, although I was about as geeky as you might remember or might imagine. Um, I was into erector sets, I was into creativity, I was into animals. This is uh, Maria, do you know Maria Zestos? She's an anesthesiologist, a friend of mine in Northwestern. And um, I had an opportunity to get involved with medical informatics when I was uh, a student at Hopkins. And I worked with this guy whose name is Richard Johannes. A few people in the room probably know him. Uh, Dick was one of my mentors and still is one of my mentors. This is a picture we took while I was at one of the first medical informatics meetings in, at Anaheim, and I won a paper competition for some work I did with cardiology. So as I think about the building blocks for clinical informatics or, or biomedical informatics and reflect on what I've, what I've gone through in my career, uh, it really started with my liberal arts background, which allowed me to have cultural fluency and to understand those things that patients think about in all walks of life. Uh, I had a very strong undergraduate and graduate medical education at that place uh, a little bit north of here where I learned medical fluency, but I also had a chance to get computer science and informatics advanced degree training at Stanford, which gave me technical fluency. What really started my career forward was getting into a world-class biomedical informatics faculty here, which taught me about the informatics needs and informatics fluency. But the last thing is at the very bottom of this slide, that's a picture, thanks to Google Maps, satellite view of where I was born at uh, 4228 Renwood Avenue in Baltimore. Uh, I was one of those grotesquely inbred Hopkins people who was, went away for college and then stayed there after having been born there. And uh, that second house from the left is the one I was born in. And it was that house where I learned my worldview, my values, discipline, and lots of other things that have been a big part of what I've been doing. So as I go through this talk, I want to give a few sort of of wisdom, pieces of wisdom that have help, helped me to evolve and I think help us to think about the way biomedical informatics evolves in this country. The first is this one. Discovery consists of seeing what everyone else has seen and thinking what no one else has thought. And if you look around, there are many areas where you may not have realized that biomedical informatics has had an impact. A few of these are very specific to medicine and a few aren't. Um, the first is linking findings to potential diagnoses. It's always been a challenge when a patient may have hundreds of possible things in their differential diagnosis for us to find the right ones. Dr. Randy Miller, while at Pittsburgh, developed a system called QMR with a large group of colleagues there, also known as Quick Medical Reference. That was one of the first very good demonstrations of tools that allowed us to figure out a differential diagnosis from patient findings. Uh, Paul Harris here, who I saw walk in, has been responsible for teaching us how to use secure and auditable data collection tools in our research enterprise. Something that a lot of people have thought about, but it really just took the right amount of brilliance and engineering to put those things together. Retrieving relevant articles. Most of us take, take, take for granted PubMed, which is one of the most important resources we use in medicine today, developed by the National Library of Medicine. And then here at Vanderbilt, we've been working hard to understand how to identify risk factors for adverse drug events by developing a DNA biobank as well as this thing called the synthetic derivative that together we call BioView. The other key thing that I wanted to mention in terms of important lessons for people as they think about biomedical informatics is that although we focus so much on technology and we talk a lot about tools, Nancy Lorenzi and others remind us that people and process issues 
take up the majority of what we think about in this field. It's the process of taking some new tool that, or some new innovation and studying its effectiveness or efficacy that requires us to understand the environment. That's a big part of what we do in this field. The other is this little slide here, uh, one of my favorite far sides, bear, bear, shark telling people to come to the water for those of you who aren't getting it because it's too late in the evening. Um, and if you look at this slide and you say, well, what relevance does that have? Well, just a couple of changes make it, I think, very relevant in that we are, we are in trouble if we as biomedical informatics researchers start telling people, please come use our tools, only to find out that we're actually compromising patient safety. Ross Capel, who's one of our informatics colleagues, but also a sociologist at Penn, has done a lot of work thinking about the role. Uh, there's been other people as well, Joan Ash and others, but Ross's papers have been real seminal work. This is one from JAMA, talking about the role that computers can play in causing medical errors. And what he thinks about, in particular, are design issues, training issues, other human factors issues, and things about the databases that may be available for these systems. And it reminds us that every coin has two sides and, and emphasizes why it is that we need to evaluate these systems. Uh, this quote is another of my favorite sort of wisdom pieces. With great power comes great responsibility. That was Uncle Ben to Peter Parker, Spider-Man. Um, and what this is telling us is that computers have the ability to reproducibly cause error. If we put a computer system into a large environment that is, that is not working correctly, it will very quickly scale to cause many more errors than we as individuals could cause. And it's therefore our responsibility to make sure that these systems work as well as intended. A guy named Charles Friedman, who used to be, uh, has been very active recently with the Office of the National Coordinator, but before that was uh, on sabbatical at Stanford when I was there, started thinking a lot about the issues of science in this field and created what, what's called the Tower of Achievement. This tower has essentially four areas. The first is model formulation, which is when we come up with an innovation that we think may solve the problem, for example, that you saw on the video. It's important when you do that to make sure that that model takes advantage of prior research and has been validated. We then go to system development, which is developing innovative systems using these models that deliver information or knowledge to stakeholders. The trick there is that development needs to adhere to evidence-based practices for design. Matt Weinger and others who have taught us about that um, would say we have to do usability testing, we must do failure modes and effect analysis, and we need to think about ways to mitigate the errors in these systems as we're de developing them. System installation, which might at the surface appear to be not such a scientific thing, is the idea of installing a system and then making it work reliably in functioning healthcare environments. And in fact, installation is challenging as can be. It needs, it needs to follow established approaches for dealing with organizational change, or it may propose new approaches to understand people and organizational issues. And then finally, studying effects, which is probably the one most of us are familiar with, simply is a lot like every other clinical research project, studying the effects of systems on the reasoning and behavior of healthcare providers, as well as on the organization and on the delivery of healthcare. These studies have to be both formative, because this is a new innovation, and needs to go through what would look like phase one, two, three testing before it gets out, and summative, because we'd like to disseminate this, so we need to show external validity. So why do we evaluate? Well, if you develop a piece of prototypic software, let's say an iPhone, and you'd like to make sure that it doesn't, say, catch fire, which the first couple of, maybe many of you may know there was a little run of that when the iPhone first came out, you need to first look at the prototype and verify that it has been developed according to specs. Once it has been verified according to specs, and if it doesn't get it verified according to specs, you need to go back and refine it. If it has been verified and you create a version that could initially be tested in production, that has to be validated to make sure that it's designed and is solving the problem it was initially intended to solve. If not, back to the prototype phase. However, in many cases, we're able to get the verification and validation correct and therefore feel very comfortable that we can get a system from the prototype phase to national use. Again, this is very similar in a lot of ways to what we think about with drug discovery. So as I started my career at Hopkins, um, I had an opportunity to take all of the things that I've just learned and to think about a problem which was structured data capture. Many of you may know that as we practice medicine, there are evidence-based guidelines that if we could use them at the point of care, uh, or if we could show them providers at the point of care, providers would capture accurate and complete information that would help to inform their decisions. 
So as a pediatrician, I started using the well child care guidelines, as we call them, as an opportunity to test whether we could build structure capture tools that would imp impact the, the quality of the care given in our area. In this particular program called Clictate, uh, cleverly named to be sort of like dictating but not your clicking, um, it, uh, used age-appropriate forms, context-sensitive help, and customizable sections to help us create forms essentially on the fly for patient care. So this becomes the next uh, piece of wisdom that I learned. We were able to conceive that model, create a version of it that was integrated into our electronic health record, get funding from Robert Wood Johnson and from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality to test the hypothesis that this tool would not impact provider satisfaction, patient satisfaction, or communication of key information in the office. So we conducted these studies and were able to identify those things, have a few papers that are out that, uh, that described the fact that the, in fact, this in fact did not in any way impact satisfaction or impact the quality of the visit. But the key point was that it, I started this project in 1993. In 1995, I finished developing this system all by myself. In, from 1995 to 1997, I was installing it throughout the hospital. And then we started our evaluation in 1997 and finished it in 2000. It took a little while. We have three papers to show for that. And the last paper that came out came out in 2008. Wow. So that which doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Uh, what I learned from that exercise is how important it is to think about biomedical informatics research differently. It's really clinical research, and it's really complex. We have to deal with things like proxy measures of benefit. So what I mean by that is I would like to show you that a system like Clictate improved patient outcomes. Patients had better developmental milestones. Patients and providers were more in sync with when their children may be sick. But in fact, that's virtually impossible because of how long you have to conduct the study. So you have to contend with proxy measures, things like I believe that a patient will have a better outcome if the provider uses a template. So if I can show you provider use and convince you that that actually leads to better outcomes, that may be the best I can do. Makes studies much more complex. Second, because we have to do that in a clinical environment, it must be done in a minimally disruptive way. So in this case, we wanted to try to do a randomized controlled trial. And it took us almost a year to figure out the right way to let everybody use the system, but only have the structured reporting for certain people on certain days. So to create high impact clinical science is big science. It's big data sets, or at least large data sets, not big data as we think about it now. And it's typically highly multidisciplinary work. Biomedical informatics is inherently multidisciplinary, and as I learned, will not be impactful when conducted in the wrong environment. And so, I got in my car with my family, and we started driving toward Vanderbilt, passing the Clampets on the way as they were leaving Bug Tussle. And uh, Vanderbilt was the perfect environment for what we were trying to do. It has the breadth of talent that we needed within and beyond healthcare. It's a culture that promotes teamwork, world-class clinical information system infrastructure, and a university a wide that understands the potential for this research. So it's possible to talk to sociologists, psychologists, business people, and really think about the teams that we need to answer question, key questions. Uh, President Bush agreed with us and came here in early 2000s as a part of thinking about health care reform. And uh, I think that's a, a bit of a testament to how our nationally visible our clinical information systems have been. So as I put those lessons together, uh, we had an opportunity to do a project recently involving health information exchange, which was really the challenge that the person in the first video, in the video that I was showing, um, had to deal with, which is how do I get providers in two disparate locations or more to share information to inform my health care? So health information exchange is defined as the mobilization of health care information electronically across organizations within a region, community, or hospital system. The process of exchange is one way to think about it, and the tool which does the exchange is another. But both are equally important in terms of how we think about this. So we started out, uh, and this was actually a project that was funded both by the t state of Tennessee and by AHRQ, and was led by many people in the informatics organization, but most notably Mark Frissy and Bill Stead, who conceived of this project and got it going, I was in charge of the evaluation. But we constructed a model, and the belief in that model was that it was possible to, explore, to deploy an exchange rapidly that was both low cost 
and minimally disruptive to healthcare entities. We also constructed a model with the belief that it was possible to get actual exchange of data quickly with attention to some of the key drivers that have failed or have made health information exchange fail in the past. One, competitor institutions' needs and concerns, attention to privacy and security, and an opt-out model for patients. We were, we were smart to assemble a multidisciplinary team, and many of those people are in the room, and they, I won't mention all the names, but it included developers and business people and an evaluator or two and, uh, and some people who understood um, security and privacy. This is the system that we developed. Uh, you'll notice that it bears a striking resemblance to something many of you may have seen before. And this was part of the brilliance, was to take the star panel interface, to simplify it, and to extend it in a way that supported data from disparate locations all on one browser. So what, we, what you see here grayed out is that these labs are coming from any one of a bunch of different sources of information, all combined on one screen. This project took place in Memphis. There were many reasons for why that was chosen. Uh, one of them, obviously, is that Memphis is a, is a hotbed for patients with lots of medical problems and is a highly, has a high population of underserved care. Another is that the governor was quite aware of what was happening with TenCare, and Memphis was a great environment to sort of show, if we were going to show something, how we could use technology to help with some of the challenges that we might have with safety net provi provisions. Uh, I don't know how well, this, this shows up pretty well, and I want to thank Kim Unertle for this slide. All of the dots you see here on this Google map are sites where the health information exchange was live. We had nine healthcare organizations, 30 sites of care, six different electronic health record systems, over 30 distinct interfaces that we had to have come into one system, 2 million patients, 400 users, and millions of documents. So it was a very, very large set of data that we were trying to carefully get reconnected to patients at the point of care. So to implement that system, we developed a governance model, which literally took about half of the time it, that we spent in the first two years to go live. We addressed a lot of people and organizational issues. We created shared processes to address some of the patient privacy and data concerns. And I'll tell you that I spent more time in meetings listening to and watching the political struggle of all of these groups than we ever spent thinking about the technology, or even that I spent thinking about the evaluation. We did a lot of work with training, and then we spent time making sure that each site's quality assurance group was equally pleased with what we did. Our evaluation team was large and multidisciplinary. We included, we had lots of help from Frank Harrell's group in biostats, computer science, workflow research, uh, there twice it was so important, medicine, healthcare administration, and, health and economics. So one of the key things about this project, again, was that we thought we were doing something that was going to be nationally important, and therefore we spent a significant amount of time thinking about our evaluation. Our evaluation included, as you can see on the left here, usability, testing and refinement, performance feedback, and training process feedback so that we could learn from the processes we developed and help the rest of the country when they were starting to implement these things. More formally, our evaluation included usability testing, and I'll talk about that in a second, Usage pattern analysis, in other words, how did people use the system? Workflow assessment, what changed as a result of putting the system in? Economic impact and disease-specific impact. Uh, I will share with you that I'm not going to talk too much about disease-specific impact, although I can if we ask questions. Um, one of the challenges of a project like this was that we had essentially five years to bring the system up, fill it with data, make it useful, conduct an evaluation, and the whole time be responsive to anything that needed to be fixed, which if any of you have done clinical research know is a major no-no. So we had to be very careful not to um, evaluate things that were changing, while in fact the entire program was changing all the time. So it made a lot of our analyses difficult, and in particular our disease-specific analyses have been statistically very challenging. So I want to talk a little bit about the determinants of use here because when you think about studies like this, and as, a, as an informatics person, we have to start and think about conceptual models that might be important to make sure that we've covered things that would make a system not appear to be useful, especially something as this visibility, when in fact that system could be useful in the right environment. So usage is really a function of trust, how well the system is able to function or usability, socio-demographic variables that relate to the environment we're in, and the usefulness of the data that's in the system. 
Trust is especially important because you might imagine that although we get data from three or four different institutions, if institution A doesn't trust B, C, or D, then the data being there won't actually impact anything in terms of patients. So usability was something we focused on a lot to make sure that the system worked well. And these are the components that we think thought about. How did people feel emotionally? Did they like what they were seeing on the screen? Did it make them nauseated? Important facts. Uh, screen agile, we learned that from Max. Max, one of the key things that Mac has done well is think about usability and, u and overall reaction. How the screens were structured, what terms were used on the screens, was it easy to remember things when you hadn't been there recently, how easy it was to learn the system, what the capabilities of the system were, and what functionality we had in the system and where it was. So all of that was important to measure. So this incredibly complex slide I'm showing mostly to tell you that to understand who used the data or who used the system, we had to gather data from a series of places, our log files about what data came into the system, other log files about who accessed the system, uh, when doctors logged in, when nurses logged in, which sites, ED on this slide stands for emergency department, which sites of care had which numbers. And our summary for all of that was that the health information exchange was used for about 7% of all visits across all sites. Many of you right now may be saying, that's it? Uh, health information exchange was used more for patients that were reporting a history of a recent healthcare encounter than for other patients. The number went from about 7 to about 12% and that nurses and physicians surprisingly did things differently. That's a joke. Um, so what information did clinicians seek? Uh, this slide, this is essentially where clinicians entered our health information exchange, and each of these were places they could go to get information. The, the data show that discharge summaries and site-specific reports were the most frequently accessed. Interestingly, some of our best informatics innovations in the system that allowed us to aggregate meds and aggregate labs, which were things that we implemented a little later, were not as frequently used as expected. After talking about this quite a bit with our group and through the work that Kim Unertle did on site, it was clear that part of that was due to the fact that the training that we gave people at the beginning was not as actively continued by the other sites who were training when these new things came out. So a lot of this was unawareness and a key lesson for us. So what did Health Informatic Information Exchange do for care? The things that you see in green are all good, and these were obtained by provider, and, uh, by provider interviews, and what you see in red is not so good. But in general, Health Information Exchange did all the things we'd hope. It provided additional history, prevented repeat tests, avoided communication, helped to have comparison labs, that's something that we could do even more of, and we could talk about that if you'd like. Allow this patient to be seen faster. Uh, in one or two sites, I should tell you this, one or two of our sites in the primary care environment held patients in the waiting room when they knew that the patient was here for a follow-up of an emergency department visit. So those patients would stay in the waiting room for one to two hours as they requested the medical records from the emergency department so that they knew why the patient was there. When this system was implemented, literally, that process went away overnight. They were able to print it out and immediately see why the patient was there and get them back, totally changing the workflow in that clinic. Um, it allowed us to change treatment plans in some cases, follow-up visits got scheduled more quickly, avoided admissions. Once we detected a public health threat, there was a, a patient who had tuberculosis, and they picked that up as an incidental finding on a patient who came in for a laceration repair. Uh, it provided fast access to referral summaries. And then the negative, which we heard in a few other cases, and I'll show you it on the next slide, was that we didn't have all the information people needed. These are data that's in a, what is called a tag cloud, where the larger the font, the more frequently this was a comment that we received. And this was data that was actually coded by the, our qualitative researchers, and then I basically added it to this tag cloud. So you can see the good news, people thought that the system had a lot of value, and they also felt that we could even have more data in it. It would be useful. People also felt that, that we could use more participants. In other words, there were sites of care that we hadn't included that they'd like. There were login issues. A, a, a smaller number of people said things like the healthcare exchange. They recognized that was specifically helpful. There were some enhancement requests, as you can see other things here. So as a part of our workflow assessments, we looked at both we looked in the sites of care and we sort of did what's called purpose of sampling to identify sites of care that were geographically different or, de or, or socio demographically different. And what we found across those sites of care were two different models where the system was used. One was a nurse-based model 
where there was routine printing of health information exchange data, and perhaps no surprise to you, much more aggressive changing of workflow in that site. The other was a physician-based model, where there was more ad hoc use of health information exchange data. In that setting, what we had was clinicians who essentially would find out a triggering event from a patient, like I was recently seen at the other hospital, or they couldn't understand what the patient was saying, and that was their decision then to go to the system and get more data. As you might imagine, ad hoc use was lower and had a very different set of outcomes. For financial impact, we, actually, we worked very closely with the Tennessee Hospital Administration to get claims data that were taken um, out of the claims data system, mapped to the data we had about which patients had their record accessed, and then all of that was brought together into a data set to assess a series of things that were likely to happen, as you could tell from the qualitative results, and we found many of them. HIE access is associated with a 1% decrease in head CT or CAT scans, a 2% decrease in body CT, 4% decrease in admissions, and that drove a lot of what we're about to talk about, a 2% decrease in diagnostic services, and a 2% increase in discharges to home, as you might expect because of the decrease in admissions. This paper was uh, accepted recently in the journal JAMIA, and the uh, key conclusion here, if you look right about here, is HIE access reduced overall cost by $1 million after we controlled for the, the severity of illness, which was slightly different between the patients who were in the uh, HIE access group versus the no access group, and some other things that we, that we controlled for in terms of covariates. And we can talk about that if you'd like. Uh, hospital admission re reductions accounted for 97.6% of the total cost reductions, and were something that was very commonly discussed whenever we rounded on the sites that were using the system. So the Health Information Exchange Project has generated a fair amount of press, as you can see here from the number of peer-reviewed publications. Um, we started in 2005. We're essentially live in 2006. We're working on this from 2007 to 10 and got a lot of papers written in just about a year. So a very different process for conducting a study. Furthermore, because of so much attention being paid to health information exchange and these particular demonstration projects, these were in part the reason why the Office of the National Coordinator started a state health information exchange program where every state was essentially given funding to build on the kind of work that we had done in this project. So there was a new lesson in this. You might say, you know, that looks pretty good. But there was a new lesson here. Um, you may have noticed that although we have fantastic data about the economics, we have data about providers, we have data about workflow, there's a group that's missing. And that was the Lady Lee at the very beginning. So we would like to believe that there were patient stories that were going to be very important to tell having had a system like this in place. And in fact, um, for a bunch of reasons, that was extremely difficult for us to do while the study was going on. In part, that had to do with people and process issues, specifically significant concern that by talking about this to patients, we would increase things like our opt-out rate by, by having patients get very paranoid about issues related to security and privacy or not understanding the system. And so we made a decision that we were not going to do very aggressive patient-related research for the study. And I was pretty saddened by that because I thought that was a really great outcome that I, I wish we could get. So I have a friend who's a character actor whose name is O'Neill Compton. Uh, he's been in Seinfeld, done a bunch of things. He calls himself Almost Famous. He's been in about 20 movies. And O'Neill was at our house talking with us about health care and some issues he was having. And I happened to mention to him that we had done this very big study and had no way to really understand what the impact was going to be on patients. And he was telling me about some things that had happened to him that, that would have made this very interesting. And he reflexively said, well, why aren't you making a film about it? And I said, never thought about it. So we have been in the process of creating a documentary to talk about all of the different parts of the Health Information Exchange project. And through that, we've been able to identify some patients like the one you saw here who can tell us their stories We've gone to different states to watch their systems go live, and we're, we're, we're trying to do, um, hopefully, the film that will be the last time anybody can ever talk about a healthcare environment that didn't have health information exchange. So wish us luck. We've been, trying to, we've been raising money now for about two years, and we have some leads to hopefully get this finished in the next year. Um, 
that documentary stars lots of people. Mark Frissy, who's over here, is one of the big stars explaining health information exchange, but we have physicians, administrators, so-called evangelists for the technology, and victims. We have Lee, who you've seen, Blind Mississippi Morris, who's a blues musician who works in Memphis and has been very helpful in connecting us to the people who have access to care issues, and patients like this gentleman who have congestive heart failure, but a lot of other medical problems that he was unable to tell us, but the system was able to tell the doctors. So it's, it's, it's looking very compelling. I think we're going to be able to teach the country a lot about what HIE can do from the patient perspective, and we're very excited about it. So that brought up the last lesson for me, which is do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. Think about new ways to, under, to understand what we're doing in this field and to look at some of the places where we may be finding benefit and um, bring in friends of yours who are character actors if you need to to help you with your creativity when necessary. <laughs> so with that, I want to make sure I acknowledge, as you can see, the many people who've been involved in this one project. Um, our development team was extensive. We had an evaluation team that was very long. Lots of involvement from biostatistics. Uh, knowledge from people like Matt Weinger, who are human factors people, and others who are not in the room. Um, people from the University of Tennessee, including Dr. Jim Bailey, who's the head of, used to be the head of internal medicine, general internal medicine there, and Rebecca Pope, who's, who's an, his analysis. Renee Stiles, who's an economist here. Lots of advisors for this project, you see that list. And then I'd like to thank Dr. Stead, John Manning, Nancy Lorenzi, and Mark Frenzy for helping me prepare this talk. Uh, this is the picture of the people in our department. We've grown quite a bit in the last 10 years going to grow hopefully a little bit more in the next five. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions. And I, and I will say that at the end of the questions, if you're interested, I have about a 10-minute video that's a part of what we've been constructing. The state just released these. There's five of them. And I think you might enjoy it. So if we, after we're done questions, I'll be happy to show that, and those of you who'd like to stay can, can watch it. Questions? Dr. George. 